Could you imagine the disciples after witnessing the death and the brutal crucifixion of Jesus? After six hours being on that cross, a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and gets permission to take the body of Jesus off the cross and put him into his own grave, a stone grave, hewn out of the rock, and he put him in that grave. The disciples all scattered. The ladies were hurt and they had no idea what to do within their life. For three days, they were up in the upper room, cowering in fear of their own life, worried that they too would be executed, worrying that the Jews and the religious leaders of the day would try to scatter them and put them to death. The men were hiding. The ladies were in mourning. And it was that Sunday morning before it became light, the ladies after the tears down their eyes, after the fear of what was taking place, they couldn't hold their love for Jesus any longer. So they got up early on that Sunday morning, before dawn, and they made it to the tomb. But when they got to the tomb, it was different. When they left the tomb, there was a rock in front of it to seal the tomb. And to seal the tomb, it was not to let Jesus out, it was not to keep them in The tomb was rolled away. The earthquake began. A stone was rolled. The soldiers were like dead men. And the angel standing on that stone. It was a scary sight. And the angel said, fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Why are you seeking the living amongst the dead? They only thought that Jesus would be dead. They thought that they were going to be there to anoint his body with spice. They didn't have an idea that he was going to be resurrected. So the fear turned into joy. They were scared to death of what was going to take place because they'd never witnessed this before. Death is a very brutal thing. These three ladies, they were scared. They were fearful of what could take place. They witnessed something for the very first time of their life. They witnessed an angelic being came down from heaven like lightning. It's brilliant white light. They were scared, and the angel said, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid because why are you seeking the living amongst the dead? Jesus is no longer dead. He is alive as he said he would be. So the first thing, where death reigns, they found life. Where death reigns, they found life. When you think about a cemetery and you think about death, all you do is think about the negativity. You think about the sadness. You think about the pain. You think about the hurt. You think about the loss. And the grief of these disciples and these ladies were overwhelmed. They were fearful. Everything that they thought for the last three and a half years was over. They thought that Jesus was dead. They thought the kingdom was done. But this morning, in Matthew chapter 28, we read that at the dawn of this day, before it was even light, these ladies came to the tomb, and what they found changed everything about them. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Or do you know that many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ? We're also baptized into his death. We are baptized into his death. We are no longer ours. We are Christ's. And when we give our life to Christ, we are full of life. And then they found hope. They found hope. When you are in despair, when you feel like there's nowhere to turn, And you find that Jesus is where you go, you have hope. These women made their way to the garden in that morning without hope. Without hope, they were discouraged. They were lost. They were fearful. But when they got to the tomb, their fear turned into hope. Their crying turned into joy. Because what they found was not a a tomb full of Jesus. What they found is a tomb empty of Jesus. 
They found a tomb with a resurrected state. Blessed be the God of our fathers, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the abundant mercies he has begotten us, to the living home through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. It was a living hope. And then they found love. They found love. You know, we all seek for love. And we all desire love. And these disciples and these women, they were without love at this time. The one that they loved the most had been dead. And they spent the last three days in the upper room fearful. And they go to this cemetery and you do not find love at a cemetery. You find fear. You find pain. A cemetery is not someplace you really want to go. When you go to a cemetery, there's not a lot of joy. Oh, we have the expectancy of the future. And we have the joy of, of looking forward to what is going to take place in heaven because of our salvation. But a cemetery is not a place of joy. We could all talk about the lost loved ones that we have had. Our brothers, our sisters, our mother, our father, our grandparents that have passed away. And we all have experienced that sadness and that grief within our life. And there is no joy in the place of death. But here they found love. And the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of innocent men. Understood sometimes we have to understand that Jesus laid down his life for our salvation to experience his love. A cemetery is a place of sadness. But it's also a place of love. This week, we have had the privilege of honoring uh, LaVon Mace. LaVon was a member of this church for 48 years and a faithful member of our church, a very classy lady. And uh, she was here when the doors were open. And Vernon has uh, been the church's prayer leader for many, many years. This man has prayed over me and prayed over the chair that you're sitting in for years and uh, lost his wife on Monday. And he would like to say a thank you to the church family right now. So, Vernon, there's a microphone right in front of you. Let me get it for you. It's on. There will be most of you will know of LeVon and Vernon Mays, but some of you may not. And of course, uh, Friday we celebrated LeVon's homecoming, and today she'll spend in her eternal home forever. But the way she got that is through Christ. And today, the death and the resurrection of Christ Jesus is what we celebrate. And I pray for each one of you every night that each husband and each wife will be a oneness in their love for one another. And they'll feel the same today as they did on their wedding day. Father, remind us of the vows that we took for richer, for poor, sickness and in health. Mother and I was married 65 years. There's going to be problems. And you talk to her and she say, her husband was a problem. Well, <laughs> she's probably right. But for 65 years, and I just, I lost, I lost my chain of thought. I, I thought I had something, and I had to enter, enter that. But I pray for each husband and each wife. Together, they will raise their children under the influence and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And remember about the problems. You will understand the true meaning of peace if you understand that Jesus is the solution to the problems of life. And I thank each one of you. The flowers, the cards, and the love that was shown here was absolutely awesome. And what you uh, portrayed to my wife made me the happiest and the blessedest thing that happened to me 
is your love for both of us. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go off script here a little bit. Um, Monday afternoon around 5 o'clock, I got a phone call from Vernon's family, and, and they told me that LaVon passed away. And so, of course, I went to the house and talked to him, and it was a few hours before they can get the coroner there and uh, pronounce her dead and, and uh, take her body. So we were sitting in the back room, and we were just talking and just sharing what was taking place. And when the coroner got there and the uh, funeral home got the body prepared, they asked Vernon, said, Vern, would you like to say goodbye for the very last time? And they said, yes, I do. So a man that has been married for his wife for 65 years started this discourse of a 10-minute discourse of their entire life of how they met in, Par in Parsons, Kansas, and how they went on dates, and at the, the place that they worked. And he just started talking about their life for about 10 years, and, which was pretty awesome. But then he did something that was miraculous. He did something that I have never witnessed in my 17 years of pastor of this church, or in my 52 years of life. I have had many death calls. I have seen them take away many bodies from a house. And I hear, I've seen the pain and the agony that took place during that time. But this one, this one was different. He said, Mama, for 65 years, I have held your hand. And I have prayed with you every night for 65 years. And this is the last time I will ever get to hold your hand and pray with you ever. Tears were in my eyes. And then he did this wonderful prayer of thanksgiving of how God gave to Vern and Levon for these years and how he loved her and how the peace of God and how God blessed him. I was thinking, this doesn't get any better than this. This is what God has in store for us. If this is death, wow, what life is going to be in heaven, what life can be in heaven. But there was a common denominator. That common denominator was they both had a relationship with Christ. And in their death, they are seeing eternity in what they saw, in what they experienced, in everything within their life. Everything changed in a phone call, in a moment, in one death. But in death, we can experience eternity. How can we do that? There's a scripture that talks about the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they were walking, and this man comes walking beside them. They didn't recognize this man. And this man started talking to them about everything that is taking place over the last week. He was blinded to the eyes that this man was Jesus. And then they went in and they said, come on and have supper with us. And when Jesus broke the bread and he had some wine with them, their eyes were opened and they knew it was Jesus. And they said this, did not our hearts burn within us? Did not we change from our hearts when we saw that it was Jesus and when he talked to us and when he walked with us, did not our hearts burn within us? And my challenge today is on this Sunday morning, on this Easter Sunday morning, when was the last time our hearts burned? When was the last time that you talked to Jesus? When was the last time that you shared your faith with others? Jesus is not here just to have church. Jesus wants us to be changed. Jesus wants us to burn our hearts within our soul. Why? It's because this day, this Easter Sunday, was exactly what God had planned when man and woman sinned in the Garden of Eden, it broke that relationship with God. There was, a, there was a brokenness. We had a void between God and man. And God had to have a plan to change that void, to reconcile man to God. And he had that reconciliation through his son, Jesus Christ. And his son, Jesus, came to this earth as a baby and lived 33 years. And he died. 
and that crucifixion was brutal, and it was painful, and we celebrated that on Good Friday, because if it wasn't for the cross, if it wasn't for the death, if it wasn't for the blood that he shed, we could not have Easter Sunday morning, and Easter Sunday morning is the power, it's the grave, it is how we have victory in Jesus today. Did not our hearts burn within us? Isn't it the greatest day within our life when we bow our knees before him and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I can't do this on my own. Lord, I am lost, but I know what you have done. You have given to me hope. You've given to me love. You've given to me joy. And you've given to me eternity, not because of what I have done, because of what you have done. He raised his head on that cross. And he looked to the left and he looked to the right and he looked down. And he saw these brutal soldiers and he was carrying your sin upon his back. And he said something that is life changing and that you have to hear. He said this, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He raised his arms and bowed his head and said, it is finished. The crucifixion was done. The penalty for your sin and my sin was done on Good Friday. The sin of the world was atoned. The reconciliation between man and God was done. We have our access to God, my access to God. I can communicate, I can pray, and God hears my voice. I do not need a church. I do not need a man. I just need Jesus because what he has done for me, it is done. They took him off that cross six hours later and put him in a tomb. And for three days, he was in that tomb until Easter Sunday morning. That's when the ladies came to anoint his body, to give spices to his body. And that tomb was rolled away. And Jesus was no longer there. We have that power. And that power that Jesus had to conquer death, hell, and that grave gives us the salvation that we need to have. That we have the power over Jesus. We have the power with Jesus to overpower any sin within our life. We must just say, Lord, I need you. So my simple question today. If you were on that road to Emmaus... If you are on that road and Jesus comes into your life, you're on that road and you have issues within your life and the fear was in your life and Jesus comes into your life and you realize it's Jesus. When was the last time? When was the last time you had passion? When was the last time you had a burdened desire within your heart and your soul because Jesus was real? Jesus is not something that we just come to church and talk to. Jesus is not somebody that we pray to. Jesus is a life changer. He is somebody that absolutely can radically change our life. It's not somebody we just go to church and sing about. It's not somebody that we open up the Bible and read about. Jesus has the power to change our lives. So where are you spiritually? Where are you in your life? Are you struggling in certain areas? Are you having fears of certain areas? Are you like the disciples that cowering in a room and scared about the future? Are you scared about what could take place? We have the power in Jesus Christ that can fix every issue within our life if we give our life to Christ. It's not about Sunday. It's not about Easter. It's about total abandonment within our life. When the Bible says, He is my Lord and Savior. He is my Lord means he is my preeminent one. He is the Lord of my life. He's not a Lord of my life. 
He is not someone I go to when nobody else will help. He's not somebody I go to when nobody else can help. He is the Lord of my life. He is the preeminent one of my life. He is the one that I need to go to first. And when I go to him first, I don't have to go to him last because he's already there. And he can hear me. He can feel me. He can love me. And he's already forgave me. Forgave. Can we comprehend that word forgiveness? Everything? Everything that you've ever done? Everything that you've ever said? Every action that you've ever performed? Every pain that you've ever caused was forced upon the back of our Lord Jesus Christ on that cross. It was imputed upon him. It was put upon him. He bore our shame and our pain. Not just the sin, but the feeling of that sin, the agony of that sin, the anguish of that sin was put upon him for six hours. And then he was taken off that cross, and he buried that sin. He buried it. He covered it. That sin is no longer the sin that you have committed has been and is forgiven. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you know all you have to do to get that forgiveness? You've already given it to Christ. He's already taken your sin and your pain and your agony. All you have to do is accept him. Lord, I see what you've done for me. I know that you died on that cross and you took my pain and my sin and you made that reconciliation between me and God because of the cross. I accept you. I need you. I can't do this alone without you. Without you, I'm cowering in the upper room, fearful of tomorrow. But with you, I can stand in boldness and proclaim who you are. Without God, without Christ, we are nothing. With Christ, we are the light of the world. We are a joint heir to the cause of Jesus Christ. With him, we can do everything. Without him, we can do nothing. Will you please bow your heads? On this Easter Sunday morning, we're talking about power. We're talking about new beginnings. We're talking about a fresh start. Jesus died on that cross. He was buried and he rose again. He took our sin and he buried it. He covered our sin and it's as white as it could ever be. But we must forgive and we must ask him to forgive us. So on this Resurrection Sunday, this new beginning, how many of you right now would like to give something of your life back over to Christ? You have something within your life is just eating you up and you just need to give it to God. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand if you got some stuff and you just, it, it stinks and you say, I just need, I need Christ to forgive you. All he wants you to do is voice that and it's there. But here's what you must do. Here's what every one of us must do. Before we can ask him to forgive us, we must ask him to give, take us. We must ask him to receive us. So I'm going to say a prayer and it's called the sinner's prayer. And a sinner's prayer is so simple. It's accepting who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did. And when I accept Jesus, he will hear our prayers. He will answer our prayers. He will accept our faith. He will take us from a broken world into a world that loves him. If you have never said this prayer, just repeat this prayer in your mind. You can pray out loud or you can pray within your heart. He hears and he knows everything about you. So say this prayer with me. Dear Father... I love you. Father, I need you to forgive me. I have sinned against you. And Lord, I know that you died on that cross and you paid the penalty of my sin and I accept what you have done for me and thank you. I accept that I am a sinner. I need you to come into my heart. I need you to forgive me because of what you have done. And Lord, accept me as I have accepted you, because I know that you are no longer on that cross. You are now alive, standing at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Lord, we accept that. 
We thank you for that. We thank you for saving me today because I can't get to heaven without you. Lord, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Will you please stand to your feet? Let us sing this song, a time to honor Christ. When we worship him, he does great things for us. Even if you've been saved for 20 years or 30 years or just right now, when we lift up the name of Christ, he changes our heart. He gives to us peace. If you want to come down to pray, please feel free to do that. Or if not, just stand and worship and praise his holy name.